Welcome to episode three of Faith That Endures. It's been a great, great series that we've embarked on. And today's subject is about running the race. None of us start a race or start a project without knowing what the outcome is that we want to achieve. And it's the same with anything that we believe for in God as well. In the middle, there's usually a challenge for us to endure beyond what we think we can do. But if we stick with it, we will see the desired outcome. The Bible talks about it and it talks about winning a crown. There is something at the end of every race that we run. This faith that endures, a faith that endures even through the fire, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a faith that endures through the water times, amen, the, the tribulation times, the trials. And I'm not being negative, I'm a very positive person, but you know, living in the times of Jesus and Paul, you know, and I know there were some vastly different circumstances to our day today. They didn't have microwave ovens, <laughs> they, they, they didn't have uh, vacuum cleaners, they didn't have washing machines. And they didn't have the internet. They didn't have cell phones, right? But there were a couple of things that were very similar. I mean, everybody ate and slept and so forth. But the two things that I want to mention today, well, one thing I'm going to talk on particularly, the two things they had in common with our world today is number one, the world of sports and the world of politics. And those two areas dominated the news of the day, just like they dominate the news today sports and politics. They were sometimes popular and sometimes unpopular. And they had heroes, sports heroes, just like today. And in the New Testament era, an athlete, just like today, had incredible opportunities and it was a, an amazing privilege. In fact, the athletes who compete in the games were the most popular people in the country, a little bit like today. A Roman statesman by the name of Circio complained that many times an athlete would receive more accolades and praise than a general who is returning home for more. And our news is dominated by sports and also by politics. But I'm not talking about politics this morning and some of you go, sure, praise the Lord for that. The New Testament, in New Testament times, there were three great games. Number one, the Olympian games. The Olympian Games. Hands up those who know, we've still got the Olympics with us, right? The Olympic Games, they took place in Athens. I've been to Athens, as many of you have, and you've seen the different arenas where they compete in those games. Then you had the Pythian Games, they took place in Delphi. And then you had the Isthmian Games, they took place in Corinth. And many of you have been to those places as well. And there's a, a photo of the screen of what it looks like to have a chariot race around that arena and so forth, so forth. But these games, those three games were staggered so that the wealthy could go to all of them, a little bit like today. And they had boxing. Hello, we got a big heavyweight clash coming up on the 12th of December, right here in New Zealand with our two of our great heavyweights. They have wrestling. They had things like the javelin and the discus. They had the chariot races. Now I know that we still have boxing and wrestling and chop put in that today. We no longer have chariot races because we progress, right? We have Bathurst 500, we have the Indy 500. We have the Speedway, right? And of course, we've added a whole lot more. Today, we got snowboarding. They didn't have snowboarding back in those days. And we've added rugby. I'm waiting for the day they'll add rugby league. Who's with me on that? One person, two people, praise the Lord. So following on from the great chapter of Hebrews 11, which we've spoken about, the heroes of faith, the people who, who, who were amazing, not perfect people, we went into that. You know, they weren't, perfect people, but they were people of faith who endured. And we talked about them, but Hebrews chapter 12, the following chapter says this, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us run with endurance a race. Would you say the race with me? The race. Now in a race, basically another word for it is a contest. Now the day you were born, 
or the day you were conceived. If you know anything about biology, you won that race. Out of millions of sperm eggs, you made it, right? You're a winner. Now, the day you're born into the world, you're in a race, a human race. Of course, heaven and hell is a reality. But the day you're born again, you're put into the race, the Christian race, which I want to talk about today. I mean, you might say to me, Peter, what are we racing about? Can I just say and mention we're not racing against time? I know a lot of people get to the end of their life, think they're racing against time, trying to turn the clock back. We're not racing even to get to heaven. And we're certainly not racing for the accolades of man. But a, a couple of things we are racing, we are racing against sin. The Bible says to flee from sin. Sin is crouching at the door and its desire is to master all over you, right? So the Bible says to flee from it. We're racing also against self, the old man. We've got to take him off, right? He'll weigh us down. Hands up those who know what I'm talking about. We're also racing away from the devil, right? The devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, seeking whom he may pounce on. And so we are running to win a prize. And I'll talk about what that prize is. The prize is not heaven. We're not running to try to get into heaven. Listen now, salvation is not a reward at the end of the race. Salvation is what puts you in the race. Romans 9, 16. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. So let me say it, and you can write it down. Salvation is not a reward for the righteous. Salvation is a gift for the guilty. Salvation is not a reward for the righteous. It's a gift for the guilty. And I thank God for that. There's an interesting scripture where Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but the sinners. In fact, the Bible says there's more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. And so, you know, when I think about salvation, which means improvement of life, and yes, about going to heaven when you leave the planet, but it's so true that salvation is a gift from God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but, but the salvation or the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And you know, it's amazing how we often think that uh, salvation is a, a blessing for the righteous. Well, yes, it is, but it's more a gift for the guilty. And we're all guilty. There's none that are righteous, no, not one. And so salvation, God's love, is a gift to all mankind. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I had no interest in motorsport. Um, my cousin invited me to go to a hill climb and I didn't even know what a hill climb was. And um, so I needed a car. So my father had a Morris 1100 in the garage at home. And I said, well, I'll take that. And dad didn't know what a hill climb was either. So I went off to the hill climb. And what I did discover is that even though I failed at school, I was very successful in my first ever drive and I did very well. I really decided from day one when I went to that hill climb, something I'd never experienced in my life before, uh, that this is something that I really wanted to do. In the last season when I was uh, racing for Toyota, I think by memory we won 42 events out of 45 starts. I had won the New Zealand Rally Championship, I'd won the New Zealand Rallycross Championship, I'd won the New Zealand Hill Climb Championship, and I was the first paid professional driver um, to arrive in, in New Zealand. We were doing a rally in the Toyota Corolla down at Tokara, and we went down, and the furthest point south was Tokara, and we had a meal break. Now, Sue said to me, I'm going home because God had spoken to her and said, take the kids home, Paul's going to have an accident. So she didn't argue with God and she went home. And then when she got to bed, God started to question her. You've been praying for Paul's salvation. What price are you prepared to pay? And she said, well, what do you mean, Lord? And he said, well, in this accident, what say he ends up in a wheelchair, a cripple? And she thought about that. She thought about the changes that would have to be made to the home, to the ramps that would have to go on and all that. And she says, Lord, I'd rather him have salvation than go through life and go to hell. 
So that was a good prayer from her perspective. Uh, I left the meal break down there and I remember going to the special stage after that meal break and God began to speak to me. And he began to run down my life and, and listing all the things that I was doing wrong. And he said, you're gonna have an accident. I'm gonna shake you up. I remember we were leading the event in our class at that stage, and I said to my co-driver, how much lead have we got, Jim? And he said, I've got about 45 seconds, boy. And I remember we were doing about 150 or 160 kilometers an hour, and we were coming up over a very fast right-hand turn, all on tarmac, and I was gonna go downhill to the finish. And I remember as I entered the corner, I laughed to myself, thought, what a stupid thought, you're gonna have a crash. And the next minute, the back wheels of my car were on the grass. We were going with two wheels, with one wheel still on the tar seal, sliding down there, and I could see three letterboxes in a row, and I thought, they're not gonna be there for much longer. But unfortunately for me, one of them was on a solid one meter by one meter solid concrete pillar. And we hit that so hard that it, but we actually destroyed the car. The boys tell me that if we had hit that pillar, about five or 10 millimetres further back in the car, it actually hit on the strongest point of the car. They said it would have probably cut the car in half and we would have been seriously injured. It was the, probably the worst accident I've ever had in my life. We loaded the car up onto the trailer. We took it home. Sue hadn't had any communication from me. I walked into the bedroom and the first question she asked me was how bad's the car? sort of speaks to you a little bit. Now you'd think the next day I'd get out of bed and I'd be a new man, but no, I wasn't. He still had to work on for me for another couple of years before I finally gave my life to Christ. But I'm just thankful for my wife that she continued to pray for me. Well, my faith now is removed from the faith and my abilities and myself to, I'm anchored upon the rock, which is Christ, Jesus Christ and he is the Lord of my life. So you're really a servant to God. Now that can sound strange if you don't understand it, but that's a privilege. And, and you've got such confidence, like uh, it's a chaotic world we're living in now and many people don't understand what's going on. And I don't say I have a clear picture either, but I do know where we are heading and I do know the things that are yet to come and all that I see is happening, the things that are important to God, the world is trying to convince people that they're no longer important. And yet, do they ever look at the results of what they achieve? Because when we were racing, the stopwatch was what told us whether we're going better or we're going slower. Because many times the car felt fast and the stopwatch said it was slower. So you must believe the stopwatch. I must believe God's words. And when I look at the fruit of my wife, I look at the fruit of my children, I look at the fruit of my grandchildren, I say, God, you are good. You do know the way. See, God had mercy on me. God had mercy on you, right? And He had mercy on us and put us in this race. Now you may not like to hear it, and this is a problem today in our Western world, because all of us love comfortability, right? We all love the holidays lying in the sun and just taking our ease in Zion. And I understand that. Of course, back in the Apostle Paul's day, it wasn't that easy. Life wasn't easy. I mean, you read what he went through, but life itself wasn't easy. But you know what the Word and the course of Bible still stands today, right? It's still relevant today, right? This is where we get our doctrine from, not out of life circumstances, but out of the Word of God. You may not like to hear it, but the word for race, the Greek word is the word agon, A-G-O-N. It's where we get our word agony from, agony. The writer here is talking about a marathon. Hands up those who run a marathon or a half marathon. Some of you need to get out more. The writer is not talking about taking a stroll. Who's taking a stroll? Come on, every hand should go up. It's easy to take a stroll, right? But he's talking about a race that is both grueling and agonizing. Now, there's a photo of me uh, a few years back in Middle East, but this is one of the half marathons I ran. Now, you don't just go out and run a half marathon. You train for it. I'll talk about it. 
But the thing is, when you run a marathon, and there's another photo come up of, uh, of a marathon, what happens in a marathon is when you get the crowd, they lift you. When you're coming the last four or five Ks in that agony part, there's a crowd that's cheering you on. Come on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? They lift you, right? They lift you. You know the COVID? Of course, you know and I know many sports events are played now in empty stadiums. You see the British soccer, right? And there's nobody in the crowd. The crowd lifts you, right? I mean, the sports stars will tell you they can feel a difference when there's no crowd. Hebrews 11, the great cloud of witnesses. We're talking about the saints of old. We're talking about Abraham. We're talking about Moses. We're talking about Joshua, Jeremiah, Elijah. We're talking about the disciples, Peter, James, and John. And then, of course, non-biblical people, but we know down through the ages, people like Polycarp, Luther, Wycliffe, Fox, and Knox, and Luther, and Spurgeon, and Wesley, and Hudson Taylor. All these amazing people. Let me read you just a, a quick thing about Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael, one of the heroes of faith that's up there now, cheering you and me on. Amy, Amy Carmichael lived, she was born in 1867. She died in 1951, so it's fairly relevant. Year after I was born. At the age of 15, she committed her life to Christ. And at, at the age of 21, she heard Hudson Taylor talking about the China Inland Mission. She felt called to the mission work. Initially, her attempts to get on the mission field did not go smoothly. She's only five foot tall. Any short people here today? You're going to tell me it's a disadvantage? But in any case, she suffered from a number of ailments, some of them which would permanently plague her. She was rejected for work in China. Undeterred, she applied to another society and then spent time in Japan, China, Sri Lanka. Before finally arriving in southern India in 1895, she put down her roots and died there 55 years later. Just moving on. It says, Amy suffered a serious fall in 1931, remained beard bound in Dover for the remaining 20 years of her life, remained beard bound. Now, some of you would say, well, where's her face? She should have got healed, right? Now, praise the Lord for healings. Healings do take place. But I hold these people up as heroes of faith. Life did not always go well for these people. I've read many of the stories. And these people are amazing. Typically, she refused to waste her time, involving herself in prayer and in writing 35 books from a bed. Her writings reveal a profound faith, deep and refined by suffering. Amy has contributed many quotations to the Christian world, and here are some of my favorites. Prayer is the core of the day. Take prayer out, and the day would collapse. I wonder how many, without bringing any condemnation, how many people spent some time in prayer. If you've never been hurt by a word from God, it's probably that you've never heard God speak. She said, the saddest thing one meets is a nominal Christian. One can give without loving, but one cannot love without giving. For God so loved the world that he gave. And so these saints of old, they weren't perfect people, but they're up there in heaven, hallelujah. And they're called the great cloud, and they're watching us. They're looking at us, and they're cheering us on. And so you've got the contest, you've got the crowd. Number three, you've got the conditioning, the conditioning, the training. Hello? But 1 Corinthians 9, 26, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives a prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now you know and I know when you see a boxer go 12 rounds in the ring, you know that there was week after week after week, day after day after day of discipline and training, right? To be able to go that 12 rounds. And when you read Hebrews 12, it says, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles us. You know, when you're running a race or playing any sport, you cannot afford to let anything slow you down. Are you with me today? There has to be some discipline if you're going to win. And the writer mentions two things. Number one, the weights that slow you down. And two, the sin that trips you up. You 
usually when we hear the term that we have to do some disciplining or some training, we usually cringe at that thought. But really, the habits that we have in our life, the good ones, of course, took discipline to begin with. It takes discipline to start something. It takes a choice. Can I give you a tip on some of the things in life? Make one choice. Don't keep revisiting that decision. If you choose to have a tidy house, keep it that way. Don't revisit that decision. I chose to tithe. I chose to be a generous person. I don't want to revisit that. That is something that I do and it is now a habit in my life. Things that seem so difficult to start with, they will become habits. And you know what? They will also become character building. They will. And the atmosphere within your home, your workplace, no matter where you are, will change because your character is growing. You are growing into maturity and wholeness. There are things that are not necessarily bad in themselves, but they will slow you down. For example, what does a runner do when he runs? They strip down to the bare necessities. Now you've seen and I've seen on TV, the athletes today, they, I mean, they're nearly, I mean, they look like they're going to the beach, right? Right? You lay aside every weight. I mean, their shoes, whatever they're wearing. And we're encouraged also to lay, so here's my point. Good things are bad things if good things keep you from the best things. Good things are bad things if they keep you from the best thing. See, there's a lot of things that are not necessarily wrong, but they're wrong for you if they slow you down. What does the Apostle Paul said, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are helpful. Expedient, in other words. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And so there's weights that can slow us down. They can be good things, but they can keep us from our run. Secondly is the sin that so easily entangles us. Now that word means to trip you up. There are sins that must be laid aside. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The race that is set before us. See, you have got a course, I've got a course. You've got a lane, I've got a lane. My course is not your course. So many preachers come through often wanting to drag you into their lane. You've got a course. What's your course? What have you been called to do? Have you been called to business? Have you been called to, to be a mother, to bring up children? Have you been called as a school teacher? What's your course? What's your lane? I've had people try to suck me into their lane. Even over the years, different businesses trying to get me involved in different things. I've got to stay focused on what God has called me to do. You've got to stay focused on what God has called you to do, right? Don't drag other people into your lane. You've got a course. So you got the contest, you got the crowd, you got the conditioning, you got the course. I'm nearly through, you got the coach. Everybody say the coach. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith. The word author literally means an example. He is our example. Faith comes by beholding Jesus. And a friend, if you're having difficulty with faith, maybe it's because you're not looking at Jesus. Maybe you got your eyes on other things. Now, there's nothing wrong with things as long as things don't have you. But if all you are looking at is things and not looking under Jesus, you're going to have a trouble with faith. We don't need great faith. We need faith in a great God. We've got a great Savior. Put your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The word finisher means perfecter, means perfecter. He is a completer. That's another word for it. He's the one who gives you strength for the race. Hallelujah. It's not too difficult. Think about what these heroes of faith went through. Hallelujah, you and I have got easy today. But I do wonder what's coming on the planet. Unless we get some steel in our backbone, we won't make it. The Bible says even the elect can be swept away. And finally, the crown. Everybody say the crown. Those athletes, sportsmen who competed so long ago, they would win a crown. There's a, a wreath, a picture of a wreath that comes up. The apostle Paul talks about it. Hallelujah. And he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I praise God that Jesus, he traded in his crown of thorns for a golden crown. Revelation 14, 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. What was the joy set before him? 
What was the joy? That Jesus could endure the cross. The joy was you. The joy was me. The joy was you. That's the joy. How do I know that? Because the Apostle Paul talks about it, how the church there at his time was his joy, his crown. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and our joy. 1 Corinthians 9.24, we talked about running a race. It says, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. In 2 Timothy 4.5, look at it now. When he said, I fought the fight, I finished the faith, and so forth. He says, finally, there's laid out for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who loved his appearing. James 1.12, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to all those who love him. My last scripture, 1 Peter 5.4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Hallelujah. God is a rewarder of those who do diligently seek him. And so can I encourage you to have faith to endure? What a life we've all been called to live and what a life we've all been called to race as it were. And you know, we're not racing in the sense of on a treadmill trying to get through life. No, we're enjoying the journey. But you know, Jesus, the great, if you like, the great comforter, the great partner of life, He wants to come into your world and walk with you through life. You know, it's amazing how when you go through things, you do need the power of the Holy Spirit. You do need Jesus, the hope of glory in your life. And you know, when the chips are down, when there's an earthquake, I often say there's no atheist in earthquake, people pray when things happen. And so why not call upon the name of the Lord even before they happen? You know, walk with the Lord. And as you walk with Him, I know that He speaks with you and talks with you. And so open up your heart to Christ. Open up your heart by saying a prayer, a prayer along the lines of, Dear Jesus, would you come into my heart? Would you forgive me my sin? I thank you, Lord, that you died for me, you gave your life for me, and I now give you my life. You know, by saying a prayer like that, He comes in and washes away every sin, heals every hurt. Pick up the Bible, God's Word to you and God's Word for you, and begin reading about the promises of God. I know that if you find a great church and become part of it, you'll walk and talk with God, and God will bless your life. We are sons. We are daughters. We are mates. We are generations. Here, you'll feel welcome no matter who you are and meet real people, people just like you. We are adventure seekers. We are risk takers. We're co-workers, we're hard workers, and we're hard cases. We are mountain climbers. We are mountain movers. We are game players, and we are game changers. We're glass half fullers. We're future thinkers, and we're coffee drinkers. We are sweethearts and we are sweet tooths. We are housekeepers and caretakers of our place and yours if you need it. Here at City Impact, it's fun, it's rowdy, it's honest and it's exciting. And you're invited to come and be a part of it.